Good morning and greetings to all of you. It's been a real blessing to be here this morning. And this morning I had a little bit of time and sitting there in my chair and I read those encouraging notes that you all put in that little cup and I want to thank you. It, uh, it meant a lot to hear your, how you feel about the church and what you like and I thank you for that. It was a real blessing. God is good. So the title of the message this morning is, maybe before I, I say the title is, in your eyes or in your mind, what's the reason for communion? Anyone have an answer? There's one one thing. Go ahead. Remember what Jesus did for us. Yes. So without Jesus, we wouldn't we wouldn't be doing this. So it's Jesus that makes all the difference. So there was this illiterate couple. And if you don't know what illiterate means, it means they couldn't read. They couldn't write. I mean, they could write if they looked off of something, but they were illiterate. And they became converted. They went to, they started attending a Bible study. And they became converted and they accepted Jesus as their savior and so the, the men in this Bible class were getting together and they were having this Bible study. And then they decided to do some something for someone else and they decided to all wear one color shirts. I, I don't exactly remember what color the shirts were. But they were, they were all wearing this one color of shirts. And so this illiterate man went to this function and he come home and he was kind of depressed. And he told his wife, he said, they all had something wrote on their shirts and I didn't. And his wife, being the positive model that she was, being illiterate and all, she said, uh, oh, that's okay, I'll, I'll write something on your shirt. So she, she uh, looked across the street and there was a storefront over there and she's seen there was something written on it. So she writes this on the back of his shirt, what was in the storefront. And he goes to the next gathering and, and he comes home and he was so happy. And he said, uh, he said, I'm not sure what you put on the back of my shirt, but whatever you did, the men all agreed with it. They said it was it was amazing. And what it was, was underneath new management. Under new management is what she wrote on the back of his shirt. And as children of God this morning, we're under new management. When we give our life to Christ, we're under new management. Without Jesus, we wouldn't be here. Jesus makes all the difference. This brother, I believe, knew there was something different, and so did everyone around him. And it kind of goes well with what John shared in his opening devotional you know are we awake this morning are we are we thinking about what we're doing is it real in our lives is it something that we're awake and we're living a post crucifixion in that era where we recognize what Jesus did it wasn't because of what you did but in spite of what we did In Jeremiah 13, 23, there's a verse that says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? The truth is, 
as a human, we're a sinner. Lost and undone and separated from God by a wide chasm that only through the love of God and the gift of his only son made it possible for us to be here and commemorate his death and suffering on the cross that day. It is Jesus who makes the difference in the lives of the fallen men. Ephesians 2 verse 4 it says that he gave us love. God's great love. The love for sinners. That everlasting, undying, never ceasing love. It was this great love of the Father that compelled him to send his only son. To die for our sins on the cross. It was this love that bound Jesus to the cross. It was his love for sinners that caused him to willingly drink that bitter cup. In Gethsemane. It is Jesus who makes the difference. The cost of his redemption. If we look at. Decide to read out of Ephesians 1 this morning. You can turn to that. Ephesians 1 verses 3. Through 14. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, to whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Paul writing here. So the price for your redemption was his precious blood. We were redeemed because Jesus died and gave his life On the cross for us. When Jesus died on the cross. The innocent was dying for the guilty. And that's something that I I think that we need to remember. Is that it took an innocent person's life. To redeem us. Because we were guilty. We were the ones that were guilty. And he was innocent. He who had no sin. Was dying for those. Who only had sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21. We can read that. And when Jesus died. Shedding his blood on the cross. He satisfied. All the just demands. Of an almighty God. Regarding sin. You know. When I think of the Old Testament. And how they used to take all these animals. Up to this altar. And they'd kill all these animals. I mean thousands of goats. And sheep. And oxen. And pigeons and and uh, doves i mean th- there was so much blood that was shed for a, a, an offering because of sin and it never 
blotted out that sin. It never took away the sin. It never took it away. It was just like it, it, it added upon. I mean, there was probably millions of gallons of blood shed. Sacrificial. But when Jesus came, that blood that was shed was enough for everyone. It just continues to go on and on and on. First John 4.10 says, Herein is love, that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means that which satisfies. It satisfied God. It was enough. Jesus died for sin, and God for forever, God was forever satisfied with what Jesus did. When Jesus, when, when people come to Jesus... For salvation. When they realize that all they need to do is belief. That's enough. Having faith in what God did for mankind is enough. Believing. Come to him and there will never be a fee. There's no fee for this. Salvation will be freely given. Come to him and he will save you for an eternal soul. And give you everlasting life. And forgiveness of sins. You know, Paul says that according to the riches of his grace, because God has set his grace upon us, he set in motion a plan to save us, not out of his riches, but be, but by his riches. His riches, his grace comes out of his riches. Like, it's not something that, well, I'll just do a little bit. He gave it all he had. Everything. And you know, when, I, when I'm going through life and I realize that Jesus, Jesus gave everything he had. Like God gave his only son. And I'm asking myself, do I give it all I've got? Do I give it all I've got? You know, it's not because of what you give isn't what you're going to get out of it. But we should do it because we feel it dutiful for us to do everything that we can because of what Jesus did for us. It is our duty to tell the lost and dying world around us what Jesus did for us. What Jesus did for them. But unless they believe, they will not be saved. Unless we believe, we cannot be saved. It is out of his riches. How are we? In the riches that God has given you. The grace. Are you sharing that? God has not given us a redemption that has limits. But he has given us a redemption that knows absolutely no limits. There's no limits to God's redemptive power. None whatsoever. Think about it. In verse 3 here in Ephesians 1, he has blessed us with spiritual blessings. In verse 4, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Before the foundations of the world, he chose you. In verse 5, he adopted you into his family. You're adopted into the family of God. In verse 4, he has changed our lives and he has determined that we will be with him in heaven someday if we remain faithful. And you know, why did God do that? Because it brought him pleasure to do that for mankind. It brought glory to God to do that for mankind. When God redeemed us, he did not do it part way. He did not set limits to his grace towards us. And when he redeemed us, he did it according to the riches of his grace. And that God continues to lavish his grace upon mankind today. For eternity to eternity. 
That is why we are told that God is to be praised for his redemption. It is only through Jesus. You know, years ago there was a there was a drunken man by the name of Harry Monroe. And he had decided that uh, he'd live, he was living in Chicago and he had decided that he's going to go out to Lake Michigan and drown himself. And as he was going, as he was stunk, stumbling along in his drunken stupor, he passed the Pacific Garden Mission. And someone was standing there at the door of this mission, this church. And they grabbed him and pulled him in and he fell there on his on the doorstep of this mission. And it says the superintendent carried for, cared for him, gave him a bed and explained the gospel to him. And the, ne- the, ne- the next morning when he woke up, that day, Harry Monroe was transformed by the grace of God. Later, he was to preach the gospel from that same platform where once he had slept in a drunken stupor. Mr. Monroe became news... The, Mr. Monroe, superintendent of the mission, and Mr. Monroe became the superintendent of the mission, and when he died, he took all day, it took all day for people to pay their respects. A newspaper editorial described him as one of the most useful men in Chicago. Mr. Campbell then raised this penetrating question, what made the difference? The world would not have missed this penniless derelict if he had jumped into the lake and drowned himself. But God saw great value in Harry Monroe. And you know, we can go through life. The world may not care if you take your own life and you die. But I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus cares. Jesus cares and Jesus sees each and every one as someone that he can use in the building of his kingdom. Even though you might feel useless at times, God can use you. He died to save sinners and to set sinners free. So that they can live bountiful, successful lives that are a privilege. People that can be a privilege to be around. It can be a great and wonderful thing. Ephesians 2 verse 5. He gave us his life when we received Jesus. He made us alive in him. We die when we die to sin and Satan and to ourselves. We become alive in the Lord, our Savior, and what he has done for us. Paul tells us that the redeemed enjoy the forgiveness of sins through the redemption that they have in Jesus. The word translated forgiveness refers to a pardon. When it comes to our sins, it means our sins have been put away from us, though they had never happened. You know, in the Old Testament, when they did these sacrifices... It didn't take their sins away. It just covered their sin. It didn't take them away. But when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and gave his life, it took our sins away. It says he remembers them no more. And you know, I often have to think of it this way. You know, we someone does something to you and it really hurts, right? Someone has done something to me and it really hurts, right? But we forgive that person. And we say, we forgive you. It, it's okay. We forgive you. But you know, when that person does something again, do you still remember that? That comes back, don't it? You remember that. Yeah, that's just like him. He did that before. He's going to do it again. You know, God doesn't operate that way. It says when Jesus forgives, he remembers it no more. It's gone. Friends, we need to have that mindset as well. That when we forgive... We remember it no more. Jesus does not remember it once you have asked for forgiveness and you have felt forgiven. May we feel 
like we're forgiven this morning. That we have poured out our life before an almighty God that gave His only begotten Son. And that's why we're here to partake in communion today. Too often, and, and, and probably most times, you know, human forgiveness is more on the conditional level. But Jesus, the unconditional forgiveness of what mankind has done. This is how forgiveness works with God. When the Lord forgives, he also forgets. When God forgives, he takes sin and he puts it away. He takes our sins and he treats them as if they had never, we had never committed them in the first place. What is our testimony this morning? When John the Baptist testified of Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The phrase taketh away means to carry off. It means to carry it away, carries it away. When Jesus died on Calvary for our sins and he was laid, it was laid upon him and he was judged in place of his people. God judged him as if he were guilty of all our sins. He judged him as if it was John Gingrich or Eli Somi or Steve Kurtz there. Judged him. But he hadn't done it, but he took it on himself. Now, because our sins have been paid, they can also be forgiven and put away. We come to Jesus by faith. It is as if our past had never occurred. God does not remember. What I have done when I have truly asked for forgiveness. Can we grasp that this morning? When we come to Jesus and are redeemed, everything change, changes. Old wicked sinners like us are brought into a grace relationship with God. And our sins are forgiven. Our stains are washed away. In his blood, even our very natures are changed through a born again conversion of what Jesus Christ has done for us. In Peter 1 verse 4, 2 Peter 1 verse 4, God accepts us. It says that God accepts us not as we are in ourselves, but as he has made us in Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done, God accepts us. When we accept Jesus, God accepts us. The results of redemption in our lives are eternal. They are wonderful and they are glorious. God is to be praised for the results of his grace and his love in our lives. Let's always remember to praise God for what he has done. It is through Verse 8 tells us that God's grace, in Ephesians 1, verse 8, says God's grace has abounded toward us and he has given us wisdom and prudence. Wisdom has the idea of a sanctified knowledge. A sanctified knowledge, something that continues, the knowledge that continues to grow and it continues to be sanctified. It is the ability to understand the things of God. And the word prudence refers to understanding and insight. Having an understanding and an insight into the word of God is what prudence means. It is through this wisdom and prudence that God has made known unto us the mystery of his will. You see, God in his grace for his own glory, he gave his, us his son and he opened our eyes to see the deep things of God. And when we see the deep things of God... He has allowed us to redeem, to be redeemed and to understand the matters of life and death. And here on earth, he has allowed us to comprehend what heaven could be like and what hell is like. His word describes heaven and hell. And when we, when we understand that and we see the, the, the difference between time and eternity, God has given us 
He has helped us to understand that there's a difference. There's a difference because eternity, there's no end. There's no end to eternity. Time, you know, everything goes by time. You know, how often has someone come to you and he says, Hey, I'm running late. I'm running out of time. Friends, we're going through life. And if we haven't made that decision to follow Christ, we're running out of time. That clock is ticking. Friends, when, when someone dies in the hospital, when someone dies, they write down, he died at 11.59 and 4 seconds. Or, or it might have been at noon time. Time. Eternity has no time. Do we understand the depth and the power and the influence of sin? And the fact of His love for, all, for us because of that, in spite of the sin. Can we comprehend that? When we have wisdom and prudence, we can understand that. It says that all of those things are hidden from those who are dead in trespasses and sin. Those who are dead in the trespasses and sin cannot grasp that concept of time or eternity, of heaven or hell, of life, of death. They cannot grasp that. Jesus said it this way. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Luke 10, verse 21. Paul said it this way, But, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the things of God. The things of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10. So God, for his own glory, his own purposes, opened our eyes and he lets us see the truth. The truth that only comes by the word of God. He uses that truth to give us faith. To help us believe. And to help us recognize that through ourselves we are nothing. It is only through Jesus that we can be redeemed souls. You know, when I think of someone that is dead... Dead to sin and dead to the world and alive to Christ. I think of it this way. You know, there can be this person. Say, say, say take for instance, you take this person in Dubuque that lives in a very sinful state. And he goes to the bar every weekend. And he might even go there during the week and he just gets drunk. Okay? And he might go to... He might go somewhere to a place lottery, like he'll play the lottery and he'll just gamble all his money away. Or he might go somewhere where he's very immoral. And one day this person dies. And he's in a hearse and he's in this, he's in this coffin. And he's going down the road and his body is in his coffin and he's going down the road. Now remember he's dead. And he passes the bar. It doesn't mean nothing to him. The bar doesn't mean nothing to him anymore. He goes past where he used to go gambling, and it doesn't mean anything to him anymore. He's dead. He goes, he goes past, past this place where might have been a lot of immoral activity. It doesn't bother him anymore. 
because he's dead. But it's also too late. My friends, when we become redeemed saints, when we become redeemed, we need to be dead to that stuff as well. We need to be just like that man in the coffin. When we go down the street, that thing that bothered me yesterday should no longer bother me. It should be gone. Are we dead to those sins, trespasses in life? We should be just, what, that word dead, it means the same, has the same meaning as it does for someone that dies. Dead. Galatians 2, verse 20 and 21 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Do we understand that the law does not bring the grace of God. We need to recognize that. Romans 6, 6 through 9 says this way, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Friends, death. You know, that first song we sang this morning, Victory in Jesus. Friends, we can have victory, praise God. We can be victorious. We can live life victoriously. Because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. He took that bitter cup when his disciples were asleep. He took that bitter cup and he said, let's go. Are we willing to do that to be victorious? We can be. You know, you've probably heard about the story of, of the man that his name was printed in the, uh, in the death column, the obituary column of the newspaper. And he wakes up the next morning, he gets the newspaper, he sees his name in the obituary. And it really irritated him. Which, who of us, if you see your name in the obituary would be a little bit upset. So he goes down to the newspaper printing press and he says, Hey, why is my name in the obituary section? Well, sir, it was a mistake. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not dead. I'm, I'm standing right here. I'm alive. And he just continues to go on and on and it aggravated the newspaper guy. And he said, Listen, sir, if it helps you anything, I'll put your... I'll put your name in the column of the newborns tomorrow morning. You know, he said, maybe I'll give you a fresh start. That's how it is with us. When we die to self, when we die to our, our nature, when we die to self, we can put our, our name in the obituary column. We can be, become born again. We can have a new start. We definitely can have a new start in Christ. The life that Jesus gives is no ordinary life. It is an abundant life. It is a free life. It's an everlasting life. It's a life that continues and keeps on giving if it's directed by God. A life that continues to give. When Jesus died on that cross, I died also. When he got up, so did I. 
A life that keeps on giving. Those who have their faith in Jesus have passed from death unto life, as it says in John 5, verse 24. Friends, God has blessed us. In Christ, we are very wealthy people. All spiritual blessings are ours in Jesus. These truths should cause us to bow before an almighty God and thank him for what he has done on the cross of Calvary. We should submit to the truths that he has given us and should cause us to worship him in a new way. To give him praise and honor for his grace and the gifts that he has for us in life. May God bless each and every one. May we kneel for prayer at this time. Heavenly righteous, eternal Father, we come to you here, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, as we commemorate your death and suffering on the cross. And Lord, we praise you for what you have done for mankind, for setting us free from sin. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as we go through life, as we, we meet obstacles in life, Lord, that you help us overcome them, and we thank you for that. We pray, Lord, for each one that is here today, that you would bless and direct them. We pray, Lord, as we continue here, we pray that you would just guide and direct us, that your spirit would lead us. And Lord, we thank you for your word that you give to us. We pray that you would help us as we go through life, that we can meditate upon your word, and we read your word, and we study your word, we look into your word, and that your word can bring life in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, just be with Ethan as he continues to lead out here, Lord. We pray that you would... Uh, also, give traveling mercies as they travel home. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. Turn the time over to Brother Ethan.